So we'll start with opening uh, statements, and I'd like to welcome uh, David Pretty up here, followed by Christina Diaz Torres. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for having us tonight. Uh, thanks, thank you, Beth, for organizing. Also, uh, good evening. I'm David Pretty. It's uh, nice to be up here again. Actually, uh, I don't know if you remember back in the day, there was a brick wall back here with the. Uh, cement drive. I used to ride my big wheel up and down. So I, I remember this from, uh, from years ago. I'm a lifelong Arlingtonian. Grew up in APS, uh, Long Branch, TJ, Wakefield. And uh, I, now I have a fourth grader who's at, who's at Fleet and a seventh grader at TJ, where I'm the PTA president. So they are following in my footsteps. Um, I'm part of various organizations related to school activities, uh, County Council of PTAs, NAACP Education Committee, Black Parents of Arlington, Advisory Council on Instruction, um, and, and others, there are, there are a whole bunch of others, but I bring up these examples to show that uh, through my advocacy and actions, I'm able to see through the lens of students, staff, community members, teachers, parents, to provide a path forward for all to benefit. Currently, I'm a stay-at-home dad. My previous professional background in the elevator industry has uniquely positioned me to understand the business side of APS running branches in Burbank, Santa Barbara, and Northern Virginia, managing budgets, profit and loss, million dollar, multi-million dollar operations, working with labor unions and staff, and in various aspects of construction. Uh, I will draw upon that business side to focus on APS and make fiscally responsible decisions. Equity, it's part of my platform, and equity is a nice buzzword going around these days. Uh, fortunately, I have put substance uh, to the buzzword and created a four-step plan to move APS forward. Um, if you're not familiar with the plan, please ask questions tonight or, or check out the, the website. It's, you know, it's all there. Uh, next is proper planning. Uh, proper planning and projections need to take place in order to shape the future proactively. Uh, proper planning also includes creating facilities that are accessible to all parties and are conducive to teachers having a quality work environment. Understanding their perspective when designing buildings and retrofitting older facilities is a priority. Finally, communication. We need to be open and transparent with the community about how we make decisions, what factors are involved, how these, how these decisions affect the entire community in order to restore faith and trust in the community. I will listen to your ideas with an open mind and with sincerity. And together we will be open and honest about the direction that we take. That is my commitment to you. In summary, I'm asking for your vote in the Democratic Caucus on May 7th and May 9th. I'm asking your, your vote because I am the right person who has a history with APS growing up in Arlington with kids in middle school and elementary school. I have a perspective that no one else brings to the table. And I'm involved and in, in active in the inner workings of APS. And I have business experience, which is a much needed presence dealing with $700 million budgets. I ask that you join us and vote for me, David Purdy in May. Next is Christina. Yep. Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. My bad. I'm going to use my teacher voice, but if you can't hear me, just let me know. Good evening and buenas noches. I'm Christina Diaz Torres, and I'm running for school board because I believe we can build an APS that serves all of our students well. The students in Arlington deserve a board with the experience, the tenacity, and the vision to make APS the number one district in the Commonwealth for all of our students. I've built a career doing just that. I was a teacher, I have a master's degree in curriculum instruction, I'm an education policy professional, and I'm an active member of this community. I've shown that I can not only advocate for our students, but I deliver results. So let me tell you why I'm here today. I'm here because I know what it's like to be an educator in an under-resourced system. I was a high school math teacher in Nevada. It's one of the districts with the high, one of the highest EL populations in the entire country. I began my first day of teaching and I had 54 students, but only 48 deaths. Now think about what that budget choice sends to that student, what message it sends to those students. When you come into this classroom, you literally do not have a place at this table. It was devastating for me, and so I pushed myself to work even harder to refute that message and show my students that they were seen, they were valued, and they were heard. Our budgets in APS need to send a similar message to our students and to our communities. Having space where students and staff can learn the social and emotional skills to manage their own emotions is a budget choice. Fully funding competitive compensation for our hardworking teachers is a budget choice. Having rigorous curriculum materials for all, but all subjects is a budget choice. 
We need to be making these budget choices and sending the right message to our community. I'm here because I know what it's like to be a student on the margins. My brother has a diagnosed learning disability. For years, I watched my parents try to get him the support he needed, whether that was paying for expensive outside testing, advocating for his teaching, or for advocating to his teachers, or getting him tutors. It wasn't until he was in college that his teachers finally figured out what he needed to learn. That flipped a switch for my brother, and suddenly the sullen, frustrated teenager transformed into a motivated and passionate learner. I believe every student in APS deserves the same opportunity to be successful. We need to do more to ensure that every student has access to the support they need to be on grade level and that every educator is empowered to support their students. I'm here because I know what it's like to be a young person in today's workforce. We are no longer in an age where you can apply for a job that will employ you for 20 or 30 years. In fact, for many Arlingtonians, we're in, we are no longer in an age where one job is enough. That's the reality our students face and the time is now to rethink how we are preparing them for the world we actually live in. And finally, I'm here because I know Arlington. When I moved here, I got involved right away because local government matters. I know what works, I know what doesn't work, and for whom. I've served you on commissions on the county and the school board side, where I've gotten a holistic vantage point of the challenges we face as a country. We've grown, I'm sorry, as a county. We've grown significantly over the past decade, and it's only going to increase over the next. We need to be designing flexible, cost-efficient solutions that provide our students and community with the services they deserve at costs that do not chip away at their college tuition. I'm Christina Diaz Torres, and I ask you for your vote on May 7th and 9th. Okay. We got you. Hi, I'm Sandy Munnell. Um, it's time we left an experienced educator to the Arlington County School Board. Why? Because the policy decisions that the school board makes has direct impact on what happens inside of our classrooms day in and day out. I have 40 years of experience as an educator. I've had 20 of those years right here in Arlington at WNL. I have lived those impacts. As a teacher and a parent, I know that each child may need something a little different for their success. That to me is the definition of equity. Everyone from the school board on down to every person in our buildings must be committed to teaching each child, your child. I believe effective reading instruction at an early age is fundamental to our opportunity gap. We need a toolbox of instructional strategies for our classrooms. We need a floor. We need every school to have a floor of a common implementation strategy across the entire county. We need to hold our administrators responsible for the delivery of that primary instruction and literacy. There are many hard choices to be considered, whether on boundaries, funding, or new initiatives. And the school board must insist on the transparency in data. They must be getting the best data possible. No proposal should be con considered without a concrete way to assess its impact. All the candidates are pretty much, we're all running pretty much on the same platform. Equity, um, closing the opportunity gap, making hard decisions, using the data to do that, recruiting and retaining the best teachers. We all recognize the pressures of increasing enrollment. We all have a vision for continued excellence. And I think that's the best thing to take away from this is that we all believe that we want to have excellence in Arlington schools. So what distinguishes me is just the difference in that I have a lived experience in the classroom. I have the lived experience here in Arlington inside the schools. I know that when they make a budget proposal and they, they create these 600 extra seats at WNL, I know that those 600 seats are going to add to student movement, class schedules, and, and even how many kids can we fit in the cafeteria, which makes that solution not quite as simple as it sounds. When I see the data about how the population of school children will level off in five years, I've got to think back to my years of working with the schools committee and coming up with the demographic data that challenged APS's data back in 2015. I know experience matters, especially when it comes to the idea of um, how we want our students to move forward through the pathways of their learner, of their, of their learning. And I also think that as if <laughs> After 40 years as an educator, I think my perspective is a valuable one to bring to the school board. Next is uh, Taryn. Thank you, thank you. I'm never going to get this. 
I can't do it. Okay. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Beth, thank you for organizing tonight's forum. My name is Terrell Sims II, and I'm seeking a Democratic endorsement for a seat on the Arlington County School Board. For 13 years, I was a neighbor of y'all's because I used to live in Colonial Village, not too far from a key elementary school. I have a great deal of respect for civic associations. They are caretakers of the community with respect to dealing with the county and the schools in a myriad of issues from NC projects to business development. As a longtime active member of the Green Valley Civic Association and chair of its revitalization organization, I fully understand behind the scenes work and sword fights with county staff that you all do out of love for your community. I know what it's like to be on site for an event at six in the morning to set up tables and party tents, then have to remain afterward to break it all down. There's no public acclaim for the work that we do, but there is joy knowing that we are all selflessly serve the communities that we love. The symbiotic relationship between the Civic Association, PTAs, and the overall community is paramount in ensuring that the totality of the community is properly served by the county and APS. A powerful example of this relationship has worked, has worked with when I, representing the Green Valley Civic Association, along with the Drew and Patrick Henry PTAs, AMAC, and the Alcova Heights and Arlington Heights Civic Associations, worked in tandem and together in ensuring that Fleet Elementary School was built thus enabling Montessori to acquire the Patrick Henry site and Drew fully returning to Green Valley. Though we all had separate goals, we all worked together because the success of all required the support of all. As many of you all are aware, the Arlington Way is broken. It once was the vanguard of community and government project development, but today, spending hours upon months and years working with staff only to come to a predetermined outcome is not the way forward and is not fair to the citizenry. I know the pains of dealing with this process only to feel as though the community got the short end of the stick. As your school board member, I will work with senior staff to improve our project development and community engagement practices so that the community is satisfied with the outcomes that they're, and that your time is not wasted. The success of every Arlington student is paramount, increasing academic and professional opportunities, assisting parents in their advocacy efforts, and improving faculty retention, recruitment, and morale as a path there. Among the issues of which I am focusing are, one, implement North America's Building Trade Union's Apprenticeship Readiness Programs and its Multicraft Core Curriculum, TAPS, to maximize career opportunities for our students. Two, formally partner with area businesses and government organizations, our regions rich in financial intellectual capital that we should access to improve our shortcomings. Three, increase teacher compensation by providing much needed pay and coal raises, and four, improve APS operations to maximize budget dollars by conducting an internal audit and identifying efficiencies and improve our partnership with the county when it comes to spending and contracting. I look forward to discussing with you these and other critical issues. I am Toronto Sims II and ask for your vote. Thank you. Next is Stephen. Good evening. My name is Stephen Krieger. It's nice to be here. As many of you know, I am a resident of Lion Village. I live on Wayne Street at the other end of the, other end of the neighborhood. You can often see my family and I, my two young children, thank you, playing over here at the park around Wayne Street, which is basically a dead-end street. I am running for school board because I have two young children. I have the youngest children of anybody who's currently running, anybody currently serving on the board. I have a third grader at Key Elementary School. I have a three-year-old at home. I want to bring the perspective of somebody who has young children and children who are not yet involved in APS to the school board. I can't remember the last time that a school board member was elected that had children this young. I'm not sure it's ever actually happened. The schools need to be set up for long-term success of not just my children, but of all the children, regardless of their race, their gender, their religion, their nationality, their gender identity, their physical or mental challenges, their legal status, or their socioeconomic status. And to me, the biggest issues that are facing APS really have very little to do with education policy. They're really what I think about as accountability and what I call APS operations. I'm an attorney by trade. I have a law firm here in Arlington. And I opened up my law firm about five years ago because I saw an equitable issue. I saw middle-class families who had a legal problem and had some money 
but not enough money to hire market rate attorneys, but too much money to qualify for the free pro bono services that our community offers. So my firm opened up and we have a sliding scale fee structure. Come to us with your legal problem, come to us with your financial situation, and we will set our fees for you based on what you can afford. It's a very smart business model financially, but it also is a real world solution to an equity issue. And that's the same type of business mentality that I want to bring to ATS. This evening, I really hope to talk about um, both accountability, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, and the following issues that I consider to be on the operations side, which include teacher compensation, more equity, transparency, the budget, capacity, and student wellness. Thank you very much for your time. I'm Stephen Krieger. I hope to earn your vote on May 7th or May 9th. Our next candidate is Simone. Simone. Hi, good evening. I'm Simone Walker. Um, I have two middle school children at Gunston, and I am a 20-year career federal government attorney, which is why I am precluded from seeking the Arlington Democratic Party's endorsement, and I will be running as an independent, and you will see me on the ballot in November. Tonight I'm not going to list off my entire resume to you, but I'm going to start out by telling you why I'm not running for school board. I'm not running for school board as a stepping stone for higher political office. I'm not running for school board to build my political resume. I'm not running for school board to feed my political ambition or as a placeholder until a higher political office opens up for me. I'm not running for school board as training ground for my next career move. I'm not running for school board because I need a hobby. And I'm not running for school board because I feel entitled to it or because I think it's my turn now. I'm not seeking a position. I'm seeking change. What change? Consistency, accountability, evidence-based instruction, which does not include iPads, trauma-informed schools, and an inclusive and safe school environment for every single student. And I am the best person to bring about this change. Why? Because I was already doing this work long before I decided to run. I'm only interested in continuing my service to our students in a more direct way, to put my advocacy into action. And because our students deserve school board members who are there only to do what's in their best interest. And that person is me. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for your opening statements. We'll now go to Q&A. And so you can uh, we'll take questions from the audience. You can address them to a particular candidate, but all the candidates will have an opportunity to respond. And each candidate will uh, have a minute to respond. And so I ask them to uh, keep an eye on Bob over here. He'll pace you as far as time. So um, who has a question? All right. Just state your name and where you live. Uh, Tom Pavovar of the Walk on Highland Street. Uh, let me just say this. And so you all can remain seated so we don't have to shuffle back and forth. Here. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> the school board has recently been accused by some citizens of making bad decisions based on bad data and bad analysis by staff. So I'm wondering what each of you would do to either improve the school board decision making process or to convince the citizens that everything's already peachy. Can I start? Or? Sure. Okay. Go, go right ahead. We'll go down the line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, I, I interpret that question to mean something in the lines of uh, data and boundaries and, and how that comes, a, comes about. So I can tell you that from as a parent of a uh, middle school, uh, elementary school that went to Fleet, our, our boundaries were split up. 80% of the school went to, uh, uh, went to Fleet from Patrick Henry and then 20% were dispersed into Hoffman Boston and to, and to Drew. And during that process it happened, we realized that each, that the data was incorrect from APS, so each parent had to go through and actually um, 
check each planning unit to make sure that the planning units were accurate before they actually made these decisions. Now fast forward to this fall when they had the school move proposal and I went to the parents of McKinley and at ATS and I said, listen, you need to make sure this data is accurate before this actually goes for a vote because the planning units were off in our case and make sure that's not the same case for you. So in terms of answer your question, we do need to make sure that the integrity of the data is accurate. Um, so I would actually do the, the question of what would you what changes would you make for the next time. Um, the, these are very much in line with the changes in what I do in my day-to-day -day job. We do a lot of data analysis and a lot of strategic planning for districts across the country. And one of the things that we make sure that we're doing is that we're, cr we're triangulating our data from different sources. And so that often means that instead of just using one data piece, we are taking the same questions and asking different groups. And then we are taking those two pieces in conjunction and putting them together to get a full picture. That is essential on the back end, but the other thing that we need to do more of and do a better job of is communicating how we're using the data in the conversation. So what are we using? Why are we using it? To what end? So that then the community can see what it is that how this all fits together to lead to a particular decision. So five years ago in 2015, I was part of a committee that put together projections for data on what was our student enrollment going mm -hmm. to be. And at that time, the, the data that the county was working with was completely at odds with what the, count, the schools had, was completely at odds with what the county was providing. But at that time, the two were not working together. I am pleased to say that I do believe that now they are working together. But I think there is a wholesale mistrust from the community regarding what data the parents are getting and how they feel about that. So I think that the school board needs to make, do a better job of, of communicating sooner and earlier about some of those discrepancies that, that families are finding or individuals are finding in their data and win back the trust of the families who are here. To answer your question bluntly, sir, no, things aren't peachy. <laughs> uh, I look at it from two perspectives, one from the budget and one with capacity. Capacity, you know, we've, uh, we, the school board's been kicking the can and dealing, dealing with capacity from like a plugging your finger in the, in the hole in the dam mentality for 16 years now. Uh, in, in conjunction with um, how we haven't been building schools to, uh, to meet uh, future projection. So to Sandy's point, if you were to ask uh, APS and, and the county, they are working together with the data, but knowing that the county is, is uh, progressively working to increase density and we've already rebuilt certain schools. So Abingdon, Abingdon is a perfect example where they're gonna increase density in Sherlington, right? So we already know Abington, Gunston, and Wakefield are gonna be negatively affected with respect to seats, but there's no plan to, uh, to, to get ahead of that. For the budget, $27 million deficit, $16 million deficit last year to start both budget cycles with no plan in sight to fix any of those. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, so the question was about decision-making processes. And one of the things the school board needs to do a better job of, and that I think it would be helpful if there was an attorney on the school board, was following their own policies. So if you look at just the most recent boundary change decision, or at least the, the recent school move decision, the school board elected to do what they called a pre-boundary move, where they moved you know, Key, ATS, and McKinley to fill the new Reed building. Whether you think that the decision was, was right or wrong, it was almost indisputable that it was done outside of their own boundary policy. If you're gonna have policies, you need to follow them. And this is just one example of the school board not following their policies. If there was an attorney or somebody with more policy experience on the school board, I think that type of situation wouldn't really occur. And I'll give you a quick snippet of one more example that I hope to touch on later, is that the school board is not properly training their bus drivers to deal with students of special needs that ride the buses. It's a violation of the law, and that needs to change. Um, I would flip the process. Um, start with a blank, the school board to start with a blank slate or staff when they're sending out st staff to gather data to make a decision um, and, and looking for solutions rather than coming with a foregone conclusion of the outcome they want and then trying to sell it to um, the community. Um, I think the school board needs to consult with experts wh when necessary. Um, also question the data. Um, don't just take 
whatever presentation the staff is giving um, as quote unquote, you know, the right answer. Um, and every decision needs to be approached with an equity, equity lens. Who benefits from the decision? Who is burdened by the decision? Who is missing from the conversation? And why are they missing? How do we know? Okay, another question from the audience. This young gentleman over here. Uh, yeah, um, so tell us what your name is and where you uh, live. My name is Lucas McPhail. Uh, I live like up the street. <laughs> okay. Just like up the street. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, uh, just for all of you in general, uh, I noticed a lot of you talked about equity. So what do you think equity is? Yeah. What's your definition of it? Are we going to rotate? We, we want to start that, that in. So. Sure. Um, <laughs> look. I think equity has been overcomplicated, right? Um, and really, what it is is what we want it to be is a culture and a way of life. It simply means what is fair and what is just in, in achieving a, a means to an end. So in other words, a student who needs more will get more. Equity is not equality. Equity is there to fill in the gaps that inequality leaves. And so it really can be filtered in and threaded through every decision that we make, but it should become a way of thinking and a way of approaching problems in, in a fair manner. Yeah, Lucas, to answer your question, to me, equity means that every student has what they need to be successful. So if one student needs more of one type of assistance at school, that student gets it. If that student doesn't need as much assistance with something else, then they don't need it. But everybody should be able to get the resources that they need regardless of what their needs are. Everybody has needs. We all need help. We all need um, different things from the school system. And the school system cannot continually allocate resources based on school size. It needs to be based on, on need. So we can't look at a school and say, every school is going to get one counselor regardless of size. It needs to be based on the number of students that need that particular counseling services in that school as opposed to some just generic formula that's applied across the board. So Lucas, I agree with both Simone and Stephen, but I'll add that to, you know, we have to, as leaders, have to ensure that also faculty, staff, and the department heads and their staff at APS understand what equity is. Um, so good example, you know, in a staff meeting um, at APS a week or so ago, uh, folks in like the IT department and HR are now trying to, trying to figure out what does it mean for us to ensure that, that students are receiving an equitable, equitable education and that parents are equitably receiving uh, access to resources, right? Because uh, as the points were made, Sure, we all know we need extra guidance counselors, but there may be some schools that need more guidance counselors than another, right? Or, you know, we need to ensure that every teacher is properly trained to understand that they gotta love all their kids. And we discover that all these, that, these, that certain teachers don't love and love all their kids and understand that every kid has the ability to learn and attain success as they define it, then we need mechanisms uh, going back to data points to ensure that we have those teachers removed. I think you're hearing all, we're all saying the same thing. I think you're getting a good definition of what is equity. It's making sure that each student gets what they need. And I think part of what we need to do as a school system is, as, as actually as Tarun was saying, is make sure each of the schools gets what they need, where they need it. So we have some schools that have greater need for counselors. We have some schools that have greater need for social support. They might need more social workers. They might need more psychologists. So even though one school doesn't have, maybe they all get one, but some schools need more depending upon their population, then we need to think about how we can partner with some of the organizations here in Arlington that are prepared to stand with us and offer us that partnership. NAMI is one that comes to mind. Another one that comes to mind are the other um, uh, affordable housing groups that put together programs for kids. So we need to support our schools in a variety of ways depending upon what their needs are. 
So when I think about equity, I think about what it looks like in the classroom. And for me, what that looks like is you have a teacher who is empowered to be able to do what their job, what they do best, which is evaluate students, identify what those students need, and then consistently have access to the best resources to be able to give that student what they need. And so that's going to look different for every student, that's going to look different in every classroom, but every teacher, no matter which classroom you're in, has access to the resources that they can then provide for the student. And they are doing that in a tailored, personal way for every single student meeting the student where they are. That's what it looks like for me. Well, let's put some meat on the bone here. So uh, my plan for equity is to, it's four steps, and this is obviously just a beginning, and it is to change a, a framework, a changing mentality, as, as Simone was saying earlier. So you need to hire teachers that represent the diversity of the student population. That's, that's, that's number one. Number two, you have to teach cultural competency for everyone. Now that's just not, not, we're not just talking about teachers, we're talking about staff, we're talking about third party vendors. Anybody that sets foot onto an APS campus needs to understand this culture that is changing so that they can react accordingly. Uh, number three, the new CDEIO, the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, <laughs> needs to have, this position needs to have some, some substance to it. And it needs, needs to have a, an authoritarian position, which, which we will come once we get the, uh, the new superintendent down the road um, in a couple months. And then fourth, we need to define the metrics um, of what we are measuring in order to see our progress. We can use the strategic plan as a guideline to define those metrics and go from there. Okay. Another question. Uh, Caroline Holt, tell us uh, where you live. And I'm Caroline Holt. I have a 14-year-old at Arlington Tech. I have an 11-year-old at Jordan Hamill, and I have a 9-year-old at Taylor. I live on 17th Street. Um, and my question, so I love everything you all are talking about, uh, comp, equity, SEL, professional development, all of those require more dollars, right? And we are seeing both, pop, you know, the, the skyrocketing costs per student, which I'm proud of that we have one of the largest investments in students, but yet we're not having these, we're not getting to where we need, we don't, we're not getting to the kids that we need in the way that we need them. Um, and then we continue to seem to spend a lot of money in places that aren't going checked or we make huge investments in technology which doesn't seem to work, doesn't seem to have the professional development. So I'd love to understand, um, I, I think every other candidate previous to you has said we're going to focus on efficiency, we're going to focus on getting kids needs met. So what are you going to do to try and figure out how to regulate the budget, particularly as it relates to technology um, and its trade-offs for some of these other pieces? I can get us started. Okay. I'll get us started. Okay. Um, you hit the nail on the head of exactly what we have to do. We have to look under the hood and see what's actually getting us the return of our investment on education of kids. And that requires taking a, a very fine tooth comb to every single line item in that budget. Um, on the Budget Advisory Council for the last three years, we've been trying to do that, and we've been trying to create a, a way of connecting the dots between these are our students, this is what we're spending, this is what we're actually seeing in terms of results in the classroom, and how do we connect that, the, the through line between those three things, and it's tough work. It's definitely not something that, um, frankly, I can do in my, my spare time as a commissioner, but it's something that I will focus on very intentionally on the board with those staff members looking at what we're spending and how we're getting the return so we can identify the cuts that are going to ultimately save us money because they're not returning our investment when it comes to instruction right now. Okay. I think it comes down to setting very strong priorities. I think the, the school board can only do so much in terms of how that money is going to get spent or how they're going to determine how the money is going to be spent. They can say, I want to see this professional development go in this direction and I'm going to put my money f with that because that's a, we've made that a priority. There are so many competing interests right now for what we want to develop within our teachers. It's phenomenal. So in our elementary schools, we, are, we desperately need to get our elementary school teachers trained in literacy. They don't really come to us with actual experience as a teacher of reading and so we have to take them the way we get them and we have to train them that's hundreds of dollars hundreds and thousands of dollars to get them all trained we also have EL um, facing us now every high school and middle school teachers got to take English language training if you're a core teacher that's a concern that we have to fit into this in, into this picture as well then that comes along that technology thing which we haven't yet solved 
You know, how much training do you need? What, because we never really know what we want from that. We don't know what our outcome, our learner outcome is supposed to be from the technology, which is why it's failed miserably. So first I'll say the pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs that I'm uh, advertising or promoting are free of charge to both APS and the students. Um, uh, as far as technology, um, actually let me say it this way. Uh, Principals and senior staff will agree with you that there's serious waste. And of course, uh, principals can only do so much with respect to the waste in their schools, but they can't do anything about the systemic waste uh, within the entirety of the system. Uh, I haven't had a conversation with the number two IT guy. He explained to me that the reason why we're having all this trouble with respect to IT, because I fully agree with you on that, is IT and instruction aren't properly communicating and the instructions aren't being applied to the IT. So it, it behooves a school board member that if they're not confident that this IT is gonna be pushed out with the proper instruction applied, that they need to vote no. And the problem is they haven't been voting no, even though they knew that they weren't confident that the IT was gonna be properly applied. To, as for the budget, we need to, because as Dave said, you know our budget's about $700 million, we need an annual long budget process and not this three month budget thing we do. So the real solution to most of the budget problems is that Arlington needs to, the school board needs to be stronger with the county board and ask for more money. If you look at fiscal year 2020, our percentage of the operating revenue from Arlington was 39%. If you look at any other district, Prince William, 49, Falls Church, 52, Fairfax, 52, Montgomery County, 53, Loudoun, 57, we are getting a smaller percentage of the operating budget compared to any other district. That's part of the reason why we have these budget problems. The other, part, the other reason is that we don't have long projected budgets. It shouldn't be a surprise that APS has a $27 million deficit this year. This should not be a shock if we were doing long-term planning. And on your technology point, I don't have any reason to believe that the one-to-one -one iPads in elementary school actually work. I've seen no data to support that they actually work. So I would be happy to cancel that program and save the county the money for that. To the extent that we can do additional audits, I'll come back to it later, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> How much is <laughs> Put in that. To piggyback off what uh, Sandy said, we need to lead with instruction. We need evidence-based instruction, getting back to the basics. If we do that, if we start teaching the science of reading in elementary school, if we start screening for reading difficulties in kindergarten and deliver that immediate structured literacy instruction, special ed costs will dramatically decrease. Part of what's crippling our budget is to remediate the DOJ EL um, findings which also has a lot of special ed violations in that. And special ed is non-compliance <coughs> is crippling our budget. If we lead with evidence-based instruction, a lot of our students will not need special ed. And so that's a huge cost savings right there, but we have to think forward in order to have long-term savings. Hmm. Carolina, if you look at the budget for this year that's been mm -hmm. proposed, there's a line item that actually says textbooks in there. And it's like, oh, wait, wait, what, what are these, right? Well, it's because they, uh, Cynthia Johnson has seen a, um, a marketed uh, demand that we need to move away from the iPads. So, you know, as somebody who has, has a uh, seventh grader now who was part of the first pilot program when he was in second grade, and my son was, I've seen the different iterations from the last six years of what's what's uh, how it's changed, how they use Seesaw and, and all the other apps that that, um, that go along with it. And it's been a markedly different um, uh, experience for my for my fourth grader who has had this, the that had different rollout too with different programs. So we're not really sure what we're doing with that. So we need to use it as a supplement and not as the main piece of text. And that's that's why you'll see in the budget as a, a line item for textbooks. Okay, another question. Well, let's, let's see if we got somebody else out there. Beth, did you have a question? She asked your question. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, Beth, um, tell us, tell us your I, name. My name is Beth Farrell. I live in Miami. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So, I'm curious. In I, I, I maybe it's just a rumor. It's not true, but I'm just curious. On RL now, there's a lot of talk about how there's a lot of students in the 
schools who don't actually live in Arlington. Do you all actually think that's a real problem? I'll start because I don't know if it's a problem, but it does exist because uh, I've seen parents drop their kids off in Maryland cars. Um, and I'm not going to call anyone out. Um, I think because if we didn't have these budget issues, right, then I would say, you know, who really cares? Um, but being that we do have budget issues and we're, and we're you know, it's costing about $20,000 a kid, you know, to educate a child, it is an issue. Um, not to sound draconian, but, you know, we pay, you know, taxpayers, we pay to educate Arlington kids. And, you know, and not wanting to over champion Arlington schools, but Prince William, Fairfax, Howard, Montgomery County, wherever these kids are coming from, they'll get a quality education at home too. But right now, while we're having these budget issues, we need to be focused on Arlington kids. May I, may I jump in? Um, so I'm not going to say there's fraud out there because I don't know that. I'll tell you what I do know. I know a lot of our teach, a handful of teachers, Arlington APS teachers, live in Maryland. They can't afford to live in Arlington. They, ha they drive cars with Maryland tags. Mm -hmm. A lot of those teachers got waivers and permission to have their students attend APS schools. It's a teacher morale issue. Oh, I'm not opposed to that. No, I know, I'm just yeah. saying. So I, that I don't have a problem with. I mean, we can't pay them to live here. Um, we don't pay them enough, like what other jurisdictions pay them. And if we can retain our teachers that have to live in another state by allowing their students to attend our schools, I think that's a fair trade-off. Building hey. off of, oh, sorry, I'll go. <laughs> Building off of that, um, I, I'm also not going to say that there is fraud or there is not fraud because I have no evidence of it or in favor of it, but I have heard many stories of not just teachers but support staff, particularly our support staff who are not on the step scale and thusly are making an hourly wage and are making in the range of forty to $50,000 a year and cannot afford to live in Arlington at all. Um, it's not even conceivable for their families and they're working two or three jobs and so they have gotten these waivers for their students to attend Arlington public schools because they're serving our community in a different way um, other than that I am not aware of any other issues of students coming in um, from other jurisdictions but those are the only cases that I'm aware of at this time we do have an office of intake so mm -hmm. when you are coming in you know when you're gonna enroll your child for the first time you have to go through that process mm -hmm. there is there is a person there who's supposed to be tracking down that information about where you live and verifying it because you have to come in with the correct information in your hand. Three years ago, they did away with letting teachers and staff bring kids to school. That's that's really pretty much been eliminated. So you don't see it. There, it there's still some that have there's been grandfathered in. Grandfathered yeah. yeah, but it's not allowed anymore because it's been it's too expensive to to take everybody in. So um, is there fraud? I think there is, but it's being checked out, and it's been we have a way to address it. Um, a lot of people rent apartments around here and get information and and stuff and they can still get their kids in you know they just need to know somebody so yeah there is a problem or it might be a, a, f a separated family oh, where one family family, yeah, yeah one family might live in Maryland or one member of the parent parent might live in Maryland okay. Okay. Sorry. Let's, uh, sorry I just chimed in <laughs> big process here come on Steve thanks guys yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that so I think in any sort of institutional system you'd be a little bit naive to assume there was never any fraud and so the question becomes where does it come from and is there a way to fix it? And if you talk to teachers, they'll tell you that they know students that go to the schools here, they don't live in the area, whether it's because their family has um, a rented condo that they rent out to renters in the area and they live in Loudoun, or whether it's um, a situation where there's a divorced family, so my clients you know, have different, uh, one person lives in Arlington, one person lives in Preface or Loudoun, but the way the Arlington Now comments that you referenced, Beth? They make it sound really bad. They make, and, they sound, and what they want to do is they want to basically either racially profile or they want to check the license plates and they say just because you have a DC plate or a Maryland plate or something else, you are coming in here and causing fraud in Arlington. I mean, that's a ridiculous assumption. There could be any number of reasons. There could be a caretaker, a relative, somebody else that lives outside of the area. And so to use that as the basis for the fraud is just completely ridiculous. 
Beth, I'd just like to say if there are cars that are coming in with Maryland tags, you know, let's let's call up Ingrid Maroy, who by the way endorses Pretty for School Board, and let's <laughs> let's get her to to invoice these cars and see if they really are uh, citizens of Arlington or not, and we can get some taxpayer money there. <laughs> okay. Solve both problems. Love All right, that. Another question, Tom. Yeah. Okay, Stephen just complained that the percentage of the county budget that the school district gets is smaller than other districts in the area. But that number is not anchored to anything. I think the statistic that's usually used is cost per pupil. And if you look at cost per pupil of the 10 school districts that are part of the Association of Washington School Boards, Arlington spends the most yep. and twice as much as some other districts. So. Isn't that, you're talking about operations, isn't that a more operational way of looking at it? And uh, you're getting a lot of money already. Well, sure. <laughs> but it, it, I mean, it is anchored to something. It's anchored to the general fund. I mean, it's right here in the, in the Wabi, Wabi report. So I mean, I'm not making these, these numbers up. I mean, if you yeah, want to talk about- the number has nothing to do with the job you're doing. Well, of course it does. It's, it's, like it's, it's the percentage. It's the wants to charge you a percentage of your value, no matter how much work he does. All right. Well, let's let let's let everybody respond to Sorry. cost per pupil. Well, so okay. I think it's a cost per pupil as well as the amount of percentage that you're getting from the operating budget. In in all of the districts, the school budgets come from some larger budget. There, there's no independent school budgets or any independent school agencies in the area. No, no one does that. So they all come from something, and they're all coming from, you know, Loudoun County, Fairfax County, whatever it is, their their operating budget. So I think it's a fair comparison. If you want to complain that the, pro the the cost per pupil is too high, you could you could do that. But I think you have to look at whether the students are performing better, and if they are, maybe it's worth it, and if they're not, maybe it's not. I'm wondering if there's uh, some confusion because I actually sat down with um, a couple of board members and asked them. I sat down with Christian Dorsey and I sat down with former board member Mary Hines. And what they explained to me is that this, we get 80% of the budget. The 47% is of the additional m money the county makes like from taxes. So they're saying it's a, a significant amount um, that we get a, already but we we are outspending other jurisdictions per pupil but we're not getting the results and so i think we have to look at how we're allocating what we're getting and i think that's what the issue is okay another person well we're we're outspending other other districts because we don't have the extra land to go and just build a school and and have that the the operational cost we have to actually the reason the whole this whole uh, the money piece is is, you know, is, it, is it 47, is it 39, is it, it's the, it's the debt service. Yep. So it's the bonds we've had and it's how we have allocated that. So when you talk about a per student, per pupil dollar amount, it's going to be different because we are limited by our borders and because of the, like we have been talking about, how we the need to plan for the future so that our operational costs will be lower, so that our debt service will be lower. I agree with Simone, it's, it's results based. It's, it's not really about, <clears throat> excuse me, how much we're spending per child, right? It's about what you know. What's the bang for our buck? What's the utility we're getting out of, out of, out of our budget dollars? Uh, the APS is its own victim when it comes to how we manage our money. I, I chaired the county's fiscal affairs advisory committee when we had the international economic crisis in 2008, and it was a wake-up call because APS was accustomed to just presenting their budget. And every year they got the they got the dollars they wanted because they said, if you love schools, if you love kids, give us your money. But those times are long over, and there is waste, not fraud, but there is waste, as we've discussed before, IT is being one of them, and APS has to begin looking internally to say, how are we maximizing our dollars? You know, how are we valuing the, the taxpayer dollars that we're getting? Because you can't tell me you cannot properly educate every kid in this county on $20,000. So if you think about the fact that we're 27 million short this year, and we're trying to um, raise teacher salaries, give them the step increase, and also give them the COLA in order to make sure that we are staying competitive with surrounding jurisdictions, you can already imagine what's gonna happen next year. Right. There's gonna be as big, a, if not bigger, 
because now we've raised the floor for our budget, right? Because we've included all this. We've, th there's gotta be some real structural changes have to happen within how the budget is put together and what they're willing to cut. And there are some areas that can be cut, I think, very easily, and some not easily. It's just how do we prioritize some of those cuts that matter. Yeah, um, there, there's a lot that's been said that's, that's very true. It's all about the return on our investment and making sure that we're actually, uh, our money that we're spending is resulting in more students being educated, particularly our students on the margin. Um, the other nuance that has to be added into this conversation is the percentage of money that we get that's from the county versus the percentage that we get from outside sources, whether that's from the state or from federal dollars. Because we are a wealthier county, we pay more so that other jurisdictions that have a lower average income rate uh, don't have to pay as much and they get a greater percentage of their dollars from federal money or from state money. Um, what is going to be very interesting going into the future, however, is the because we just passed a collective bargaining for public employees bill that's going to be going into effect should the governor sign it, um, it's going to be very interesting to see how our budget changes in future years and how we get that return on our investment for whatever dollar amount we get in the future. Okay, now I'm going to ask a question. So um, um, what I'd like to ask you is, if elected as a school board member, what are two particular issues you'd really like to focus on in your first year in office? What are the, the hot button items for each of you? So who'd like to so, go first? Okay. I mean, I'm happy to start Okay. this one. So <laughs> on your seats, economy is a big thing for me. And on your seats, I gave you a nice, colorful little flyer. I also gave you a sort of a much longer um, platform. You guys can sort of peruse at your leisure. And on the flyer, it lists some very specific things, both short-term, medium-term, and long-term. And I did that very intentionally because I want you guys to hold me accountable. I want you guys to come back here in four years and say, Stephen, I got this flyer from you in 2020. You told me to do these things. You didn't do it. Or you did them all. Good job. Thanks so much. And so a couple of the, the short-term things I really want to working on in my first year would be to bring back the summer enrichment program. They cut it because there wasn't a budget for it, they claimed. So simply reinstate it on a sliding scale based on the family's income. It's a pretty easy fix. It could be a revenue generating source for APS. And the second sort of thing that I'd like to start to do, maybe even get for the long I mean, our first year on the board, is to really expand the Spanish immersion program. There's plenty of demand for Spanish immersion in Arlington. Getting that going in a third school would be great. Okay, uh, two things. We need to um, have curriculum standardization. Every school operates as its own fiefdom, and there is inequality with regards to our reading and writing program. We need to bring back, with that standardization, evidence-based reading, evidence-based writing, mathematics and standardize that so that every single school, regardless of zip code or zone or boundary, gets the same high quality instruction. Second thing, we need to bring our special ed program into compliance because if we do not, we are facing another civil rights investigation coming down the pike which will cripple us. And so we have to fix what's significantly broken from a prioritization standpoint before we start to talk about things such as, um, you know, nice things to have, like summer enrichment. That's great, but we are going to crack any day now. And so we've got to fix the house. Yep. I'll go next. Okay. Um, so for me, it comes down to two th the two big things. First of all, figuring out with a new superintendent, making sure that that leadership team is on the same page, that that leadership team has a shared vision and a clear path to implement it that's coming in and is going to benefit all of our students in Arlington. With a new leader coming in, it's critical that they have a, a strategy, that they have a path that they're going to be following, and that we're all in agreement that this is ultimately going to be the best path forward for Arlington. The next thing is making sure that we're getting our data right, going through and doing those data conversations and getting those audits done. Because as much as we would like to do any of the things that my colleagues have mentioned on this stage, without any of the data re being correct and without making sure that we're seeing those through lines, we can't do any of it. So those would be priorities on day one. Uh, oh, go ahead. That's fine. Okay. I am. Uh, I'm 
really, I'm going to piggyback off of what Simone said because her issues are my issues. Um, I have a, a grandson who is dyslexia, and we have been through the special ed process. And we have found when I go and, and I attend with my, my daughter for his um, IEP meetings, how difficult it is to feel like we're welcomed and warm through the process. It always feels like we're doing battle and, and we're being pushed mm -hmm. back instead of getting support from special ed. And I agree wholeheartedly with what she said earlier about if we had better literacy training, we could probably eliminate the need to identify somebody through a special ed process. So my two issues would be making sure our reading literacy program is extremely strong and consistent through all 20, 28 elementary schools. That's got to be a priority. The next one really for me has a lot to do with teacher retention. We need to make sure we stay competitive because we want, there's a teacher shortage out there, believe it or not, yep. and we need to make sure we are getting the best teachers to come work in Arlington and that we are keeping those same teachers. Okay. I was gonna say my two things I would do the first year is it's, it's start that, the foundation for that equity plan that I talked about earlier. And the second one would be with a new superintendent coming in we, they, we keep hearing this, hey, let's be a uh, school system instead of a system of schools. So round that out to, the, to take out the, the principal autonomy that we have. Mm -hmm. I like what everyone said, but uh, my two priorities, uh, working in tandem, sort of we got to fix this budget. Like we've been discussing most of this night. We can't continue down this path. You know, 16 million deficit last year is 5 million the years before. And the years before that, we had enough money and O&M and overhead and so forth where superintendents able to move money around and make it happen. That's not going to be able to happen next school year. Uh, I built this, the, the system for the Army that we use to build its budgets for all its installations. I know what massive budgets look like and how to build those things. If we need an annual long budget process and figure out, our, uh, figure out the efficiency, deficiency, and so forth because of time. The second one, we've got to also get rid of the college or bus mentality with educating our kids. Right, we we have learned, I believe, this generation of parents that yeah, college is great. I'm a West Point grad. Everyone up here, you know, has you know multiple degrees, um, but every kid isn't ready or, or wants to go to college right out of high school. You know, that's why we need the trades involved. We we need to provide every resource and avenue for our kids to achieve success as they define it. Thank you. Okay, another question. If not, we'll move to closing statements. No. All right. So, um, going in reverse order. Let's see, going first would be Simone. Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yes, sir. I don't think I'm going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, just to, you know, add to what I said, um, you need a school board member with a demonstrated lived experience as a parent on the board. 11 years as a parent, I know where the cracks and the deficits in instruction and curriculum are. So that person is me. You need a school board member who knows about risk management and compliance and how to avoid litigation. With 20 years doing litigation in the federal government, being a compliance attorney, and looking at risk management, that person is me, as reflected in my last answer. <coughs> you need a school board member who knows what it's like to have a child struggle in school without getting the right type of help, that can empathize with parents having the same issue. That person is me. You need a school board member who knows what it's like to have a gifted child not be challenged by the curriculum. That person is me. You need a school board member who is there for no other reason but to do what's in the best interest of our students. That person is me. Thank you. Almost any teacher in APS could leave APS today and go somewhere else and make more money. It's not a sustainable solution to make sure our best assets can walk. And that's how it is right now today. I personally went through the budget to figure out how much lapse money is being saved when an older teacher retires and is replaced by a younger teacher who makes less money. Over the last 10 years, it was $132 million. Of that $132 million, only $27 million went back to the teachers. That's why we have a system 
where our teachers are being underpaid almost down the line, except for a very small band of teachers in about eight to 10 year experience band. If we don't start correcting our teacher compensation issue, our schools will not remain great. Transparency is really important to me. I've spoken at school board meetings, I'm sure you guys have as well. It is a very disheartening feeling to speak to a group of people and have the sense that they're not listening to you, that their minds have already been made up. I went back and looked through the last three and a half years of votes from the school board. There were 152 votes based on action items. Every single vote passed, but one that was tied two to two. So either the school board is not being transparent with us, or they're not doing their diligence in critically analyzing the staff recommendations and the staff proposals. That's a problem that I would like to change if I go to the school board. One topic that I didn't get a chance to talk about earlier today was the student wellness. It's a huge issue, both with our middle school students and our high school students. They are struggling. There is a statistic that says that between 26 and 34 percent of our students have felt two weeks consecutive of sadnessness or hopelessness. It's a terrible position to be in. These are the kind of issues that I want to focus on when I'm elected to the school board. Education policy is important, but it's not the only thing. You've got two votes, and so vote for me, and then vote for somebody who you think compliments me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well played, well played. <laughs> Uh, when I moved to Arlington in 2005, I immediately engaged with the community. I've been a youth and education advocate here in Arlington since 2006 and tutored and mentored kids of several ethnic groups, religions, and socioeconomic backgrounds and home lives. Some of my kids are now teachers and faculty in APS. Being married and becoming a stepfather has provided me an additional perspective as to the workings of APS. Our role as educators is to provide every resource possible to our students for them to attain success as they define it, whether it be college, the trades, the military, or entering the workforce. Doing so will take partnering with our unions, local businesses, and government agencies, along with creating operational and budgetary efficiencies in APS and our schools. Educating our students is a challenging reward, one that I cheerfully do as a volunteer and look forward to continuing to do so as a member of your school board. Thank you. Thank you. They're going to get tired of hearing this. <laughs> hear it once. <laughs> and that's this. I knew I wanted to be a teacher in the 10th grade. I had a crush on my 10th grade English teacher. I worked so hard to impress him I could just, we just worked so hard to impress him that I got invited to his wedding and he married my drama teacher. <laughs> I might have lost my crush, but I never lost my direction. Forty years later, I can say I have been dedicated to what's best for our children in public education. First as an English teacher, then in professional development for instructional technology right at Washington Lee. Today, uh, uh, two, of our, uh, two of our amazing grandchildren live right here in Arlington and attend Ashland Elementary School. My husband and I don't just have roots here, we have fruit. My connection to Arlington and APS is deep and enduring. My classroom days are behind me, but my passion for education remains. My desire to advocate for my children and yours is still strong. And my commitment should be apparent as I stand here before you to ask for your vote. So let me bring my experience to serve on your school board. Shuffle up here. Um, so before I get started, thank you so much for coming out this evening and for asking such great questions. Um, ultimately, the decision about who you vote for is a deeply personal one, but the fact that it is 9-10 on a Monday night in March and you are still here asking great questions says a lot about how much you value education, so thank you so much. Um, growing up, I was like many Arlingtonians, I was very transient um, in my youth. Um, my family was moving because of jobs. And so I, picking a place where I was gonna live and spend the rest of my life was really important to me. Something that I thought about a lot, um, especially as we were moving around. And I knew that I wanted to find a place that was gonna share my values, a place that, where I was gonna feel welcome, where I could have a voice, and where I could have a positive impact on my community. 
Arlington has proven to be just that place. And I'm really excited for the opportunity to take my experience and my talent to serve you in a new capacity on this board. As I've mentioned before, and as you've seen in my answers tonight, I would bring a number of unique perspectives and experiences to the board. I bring the perspective of an educator, of a data analyst, of a strategic planner, of a lover of numbers, and a lover of budgets. We're at a crossroads in APS. Do we choose to lean in and address our challenges head on, even if it requires having difficult conversations and changing our mindset, or do we rest on our laurels and com be complacent with the status quo? If we ever <coughs> expect to create solutions that work for our diverse community, we need to have decision makers at the table that represent a diversity of perspectives and experience. I would love the opportunity to speak with all of you and be one of your first two choices on May 7th and May, or May 9th. You can sign up for email updates or visit my website as christinafararlington.com to learn more. My team and I will be around afterwards if you have any questions or want to get involved. I am Christina Diaz-Dotis. Let's build an Arlington Public Schools that serves all of our students well. I have a vision to achieve equity in APS and a plan to go along with it. I have a vision for dealing with planning and capacity issues and how I will collaborate to help bring the school board forward to take APS into the future. I will reiterate what I said earlier. I'm asking for your vote because I am the right person with a history with APS, growing up in Arlington with kids in middle school and elementary school. I have a perspective that is not represented currently on the table and I am involved and active in the inner workings of APS and I have the business acumen, which is a much needed presence when dealing with $700 million budgets. We need more forward thinking and proactive leadership rather than reactive leadership. Someone like myself who is proving he can move the needle and get things done. I am David Pretty. I ask for your support and I ask for your vote in May.